just mention a couple of things, if I may. Um, if anyone has any questions during the presentation, please feel free to enter them in the chat space. As time permits, we will try to answer as many as possible. If we don't get to all of them, we will follow up and answer them uh, uh, if, if we aren't able to get them all covered this evening because we want to be sensitive to everybody's time. We do know it's uh, getting rather late on the East Coast. And then the second point I'd like to make is if anyone has any interest in or would like to order any of the products from tonight's webinar, please feel free to go to selffield.com and complete the contact form there. And we will make sure that we have the appropriate sales representative contact you promptly to follow up with you. With that said, I would like to now introduce our presenter for this evening, Dr. Bruce Katz. Dr. Katz, Dr. Katz is the clinical professor of dermatology at the Icecon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. He is the director of the Juva Skin and Laser Center in New York. Dr. Katz has been a frequent guest on many national and international news shows and lectures regularly at medical symposia in the United States and abroad. Dr. Katz is a leading innovator of advanced laser technology, as well as many other skin rejuvenation techniques. At this time, I'd like to turn the uh, webinar over to Dr. Bruce Katz. Well, thank you very much, Jim. It's really a pleasure to be uh, talking about um, evolution and new applications of platelet-rich plasma. And uh, thank uh, Factor Medical and Cellful for inviting me uh, to speak tonight. Uh, I'll start my talk now. These are my disclosures. So, you know, what's the biologic rationale for the use of platelet-rich plasma? Well, we know that um, platelets uh, produce a number of different growth factors. In, in fact, about six or seven of them from platelet-derived growth factor to fibroblast growth factor, epidermal and keratinocyte growth factor, as well as vascular and transforming growth factor beta-1. And what they actually do um, is they release these, platelets release the growth factors and then stimulate angiogenesis. This leads to new blood vessel formation. And with a migration of fibroblasts, we get fibrin and scaffolding for collagen processing. And there have been a number of studies that have actually shown how this works. This was a study by Anthony Sclafani um, looking at how these growth factors actually work in the skin. And he actually had four volunteers um, who had injections of uh, PRFM or cell fill injected into the deep dermis to stimulate a number of cellular changes. And this study was performed over a 10 week period. And at seven days after the initial treatment, they found activated fibroblasts and new collagen deposition. And this continued for 10 weeks. And at 19 days after the injection, they found new blood vessels with the stimulation of subdermal adipocytes, as you can see here uh, in the histology. There are another study also uh, clinically where they actually combined PRP with fractional laser, uh, treating someone's face, you know, multiple subjects. And this was a study published in Derm Surgery by Shin et al. in uh, 2012. And PRP and fractional laser was done on one side of the face versus fractional laser treatment alone on the other side of the face. And what they actually found was that PRP and the fractional laser side had an increase in skin elasticity and subject satisfaction with a reduced erythema index compared to the side treated with the laser alone, with also on histology, uh, an increased number of fibroblasts and collagen uh, that was seen histologically. So what are the clinical applications of platelet-rich plasma? Well, a new one that you might not be familiar with is actually used as a dermal filler. I'm gonna show you a study we did which shows how well this works, but it can be used to treat fine lines and wrinkles for volume restoration, facial rejuvenation, um, and acne scars, and most recently, and this has gotten a lot of attention, hair growth. And we'll be going into that a little bit later uh, in, the, uh, in the program here. Well, how is uh, platelet rich plasma uh, prepared? Um, it's pretty simple. It comes in a kit. Uh, we draw the blood. It's spun down in a centrifuge. It's then activated, and we transfer it into syringes and then inject it into the area we want to treat. And here are some uh, photos of uh, the crow's feet treated before and after. 
PRP injected in the skin, uh, improvement in volume and texture. And that's where we see a lot of improvement, particularly improved texture uh, and the surface of the skin just really comes alive and have this great glow um, after these treatments. As you can see, facial rejuvenation before and after. Uh, and here, acne, even treating acne scars, as uh, Anthony Sclafani showed uh, in these before and after photos. So one area that we got particularly interested in was periorbital rejuvenation. And you know, most of us use hyaluronic acids as fillers when we want to treat the tear trough area. Uh, well, we decided to try uh, PRP because not only would it work as a, a volume restorer as hyaluronic acids do, but it has the added benefit of improving the skin tone and texture. So we know that the advantages of PRP is that it's, it's the patient's own blood products. Obviously, because of that, there's no risk of allergic reactions. And we wanted to look more closely at the rejuvenation effect in addition to the filling effect on the skin. So the, the uh, point of this study was to evaluate the safety and efficacy of PRP injections into the tear trough, and then measure not only the qualitative but quantitative changes in the tear trough following the PRP administration. This was a 10 patient pilot study. We used 30% lidocaine as topical anesthetic and then injected cell fill into the areas with microcannulas uh, to inject the PRP. Uh, we did the PRP injections at baseline and then we did uh, a second treatment at six weeks in about half of the subjects. And not only did we use um, regular digital photos, but also three-dimensional imaging using the Quantificare system, which is actually a great way to look at three-dimensional imaging. And we did follow-ups at three and six months. These are the microcannulas, and basically you can see all we do is we make a little insertion point in the cheek area and then thread it into the tear trough area. Um, the exclusion criteria for the study was no history of fillers to the tear trough previously or botulinum toxin, no history of medical problems with the eyes or the eyelids or eyelid surgery. And uh, we had eight females and two males in the subjects and five of them were randomized to have a second treatment. This is the actual injection into the area and this is immediately after and you can see it's just a little pinprick uh, with really no side effects. So here's an example of the tear trough before and after. You can see the nice um, restore, you know, restoring of the uh, volume. And this is the area of the tear trough that we were looking at when we actually did the three-dimensional imaging. And the way 3D imaging, if you're not familiar with it, the way it works is that this is the surface here, say of the tear trough before, and it actually measures the um, improvement in the volume and the depth of the tear trough after treatment. So if you look at the color scale here, basically the green area indicates the lowest point in the tear trough. And then after treatment, you see a lot less green. And that indicates that obviously the volume has uh, filled, the volume has uh, filled in the tear trough. So there's less depth to the tear trough and obviously then less green color. And on the graph, this is the baseline depth of the tear trough. And at three months, you can see the improvement on this line here in the depth, meaning that there was less depth to the tear trough. Here's a nice example of the tear trough before and with the significant improvement at six months follow up. And this is her three-dimensional image. And you can see the greens, you know, a lot of green here with very little green here indicating the um, improvement in the depth of the tear trough. And also another example at baseline and then the line um, at three month follow-up showing the reduced depth of the tear trough. So what did we find overall in the study? Well, a statistically significant improvement in the depth of the tear trough in the volume of the tear trough and also texture. That was a significant improvement that we found that we don't really see, you know, particularly with um, say hyaluronic acid uh, fillers that are used typically. Here's another example in a male uh, before and after with the significant improvement in the depth of the tear trough. 
So in summary, the um, PRP injections was safe and well tolerated, and we found a consistent improvement in volume, depth, and the texture of the tear trough. The quantitative data supported the visual effects, and there were no side effects as well. We also have used PRP a lot for neck rejuvenation, which is a tough area to really see improvement in a lot of cases. And I'm not just talking about you know tightening the skin, I'm talking about improving texture of the skin. And we see this um, as a problem, particularly in people who have spent a lot of time in the sun. Here we uh, use these temporary tattoos, uh, basically um, inject with one cc syringe, syringes and a 30 gauge needle. And we inject about 0.05 to 0.1 cc to each of these dots and do two to three sessions at one month intervals. And here you see significant improvement in the neck before and after uh, these PRP injections. And look at, the, look at that improvement. I mean, that's pretty dramatic before and after clearing up a lot of that sun damage and the textural changes as well. Another example here, before and after. You know, really dramatic improvement, as you can see, in the skin texture and fine lines. Well, let's talk a little bit about PRP for hair growth. This has really gotten a lot of attention lately. Uh, we know in uh, males, this is considered often a normal uh, aging process, unfortunately for guys. <laughs> but um, in females, it's not considered a normal aging process. And a lot of women are really upset when this happens. The average adult has about 100 to 150,000 hairs um, throughout their scalp and lose up to 100 hairs per day just uh, normally. Each follicle has its own cycle divided into three phases, as we all know, the antigen phase, which is active for about two to six years, the catagen, which is a transitional phase, this is active for two to three weeks, and then the telogen phase, which is the resting phase, lasts for about two to three months, and here's where we see the hair shedding and when new hair actually replaces it. There are really two types of hair on the body. Vellus hair, which is sort of that peach fuzz that uh, you know, most women have on their bodies compared to men. And then the other type is androgenic hair or terminal hair, and that's the actual hair that you see uh, in most uh, area, hairy areas of the body. And hair growth occurs everywhere on the body except on the soles of the feet, on the lips, and on the palms of the hands, if we all did not know that. And like skin, hair is a stratified squamous keratin keratinized epithelium. So what are the sad facts? Well, basically, um, up to 40% of men begin to notice, begin to have noticeable hair loss by the age of 35. 65% of men will have that noticeable hair loss by the age of 60, and 70 to 80% of men will have hair loss by the age of 80 to 85. What may not be as well known is that the percentage of women who have noticeable hair loss by the age of 60 is this number down here, 80%. And that's actually a lot more than a lot of people realize. So a lot of women do get noticeable hair loss um, by the age of 60 in a lot of cases. So when we're doing a hair uh, loss consultation, this is typically what we do in our office. You know, we look for uh, shedding uh, in terms of the history. Is there a history of shedding, gradual or sudden hair loss? You wanna ask about family history, uh, if there's a history of systemic diseases and what medications uh, patients are on because medications sometimes can co cause hair loss as well. And then you want to do a physical exam, try to evaluate whether the hair loss is local, as might be the case in sort of uh, alopecia areata uh, versus generalized, which is more common in androgenic alopecia, and whether there's any evidence of scarring, which could indicate uh, a disease of the scalp. And then also a workup sometimes entails doing a biopsy if it's not really clear uh, what the nature of the hair loss is. The most common types of hair loss include involutional uh, alopecia, which is just thinning of the hair over, you know, coming with age that everyone experiences, and then androgenic alopecia, which is hair loss from the scalp causing baldness, and then alopecia universalis, which is complete loss of hair on the scalp and the body, intelligent effluvium, which is sudden hair loss, which can be due to stress. We often see this in women 
who will develop a telogen of Louis M three months after sometimes difficult pregnancies, and hair always grows back as a result of that. Traction alopecia, um, which is hair loss from the pulling source, and alopecia areata, where you see these clumps of hair loss in round, um, in round distributions uh, that cause bald patches. And then scarring alopecia, which, um, you know, a really rare disorders that actually cause scarring and replace the hair follicles with scar tissue. What we've actually noticed interestingly uh, in the last six months as a result of the pandemic is that a number, a good number of our patients, particularly women who've had uh, the COVID disease have come in three months after they've, the, you know, the um, disease has resolved and they've had a telogen effluvium. So, you know, clearly this disease has a significant effect on the hair follicle in some people, and they end up experiencing a telogen effluvium. And I've seen this in quite a few of our patients uh, just in the last uh, six months. Well, what's the pathology of androgenic alopecia, which by far really is the most common type of hair loss? And here we see the balding hair having an increased uh, number of androgen receptors and 5-alpha reductase in men and women. And this leads to the progressive uh, diminution of the dermal papilla cells that's in the root of the hair follicle, which, le which ends up uh, in the hair loss eventually. And what actually happens in the dermal papilla, the cells there in the balding scalps contain a greater number of these receptors the 5 alpha reductase, which is present there, transformed testosterone to 5 uh, to uh, dihydrotestosterone or DHT, which is also seen in the incre in increased amounts in locations of androgenic alopecia. And the binding of the DHT to the androgen receptors on the dermal papilla cell surfaces inhibits the differentiation and hair follicle growth. So that's typically how the uh, hair follicle uh, loses the hair in androgenic alopecia. Well, how do we think PRP actually works in hair loss? How does it actually reverse the hair loss process? Well, it's been found that um, it actually upregulates beta, uh, beta catechin, uh, which stimulates the follicular bulge stem cells. It activates kinase signaling pathways that leads to prolonged dermal papilla cell, surf, cell survival. It upregulates fibroblast growth factor seven, and this helps to extend the antigen hair cycle. And it increases surrounding vascularity of the dermal papilla, which um, leads to platelet-derived growth factor release. So what are some of the current treatments for androgenic alopecia? Well, we know hair transplants um, are you know, done surgically, does not really address the ongoing hair loss, but in some people who are really bold, this works very well. Minoxidil or Rogaine, which is um, one of the first uh, treatments for uh, androgenic alopecia, the way this works is by increasing the duration of the antigen phase, increasing the, the uh, follicular size and duration, it often takes six to nine months to work, and the goal is to really thicken hair and stop the progression, usually in about 85 to 90 percent of people. Finasteride, which is in Propecia, which can be used uh, mostly orally, but also more recently we've been using it topically. This blocks uh, DHT, stops the progression of the hair loss in 90 percent of, of people, and regrowth in approximately 65 percent of people. And then combining minoxidil and finasteride, we see a synergistic effect. And also, you know, there is some evidence that low-level light therapy um, works in some people. The, you know, the evidence there is still not um, that uh, uh, complete yet. So let's talk a little bit about uh, platelet-rich fiber matrix. And I think this is really state-of-the-art in terms of the uh, PRP that really works most effectively. This comes in a kit. Um, basically, we draw a small amount of blood. Uh, we spin it down for about six minutes, and then we prepare it for injection, activate it, and the procedure typically takes, takes us you know, less, less than 20 minutes to do. And it really is the best in class technology in regenerative medicine. There have been a number of studies that have shown that uh, SELFA really works well for androgenic alopecia. As you can see in this study by Sclafani, 
Another one here by Dohan, also showing how uh, cell fill works for hair loss and genetic alopecia. So what is it, how is it actually different from typical PRP that you see in other types of uh, P PRPs that are available? Well, we know in you know, you know, regular PRP, activation is immediate. So the activity on, on the tissue, whether it's the skin you're trying to rejuvenate or the hair follicle you, you wanna grow hair with, has really only short-term tissue signaling. So it only works for minutes to hours. With PRFM or cell fill, we have a much longer effect because the PRP is, it works in a matrix and it can sit there in the tissues where it's at being active for up to seven days. And this has been shown in studies, as you can see here, with this study showing how cell fill can actually work for up to um, seven days and how the growth factors, each of these are different growth factors on each of these lines, and these, each of these growth factors are actually having activity for seven days compared to other PRPs, which are really only working for minutes to hours. So that really makes a big difference when you're wondering, well, how is it affect, how, why is it more effective with cell fill? Well, it acts on the tissues for a longer period of time with the growth factor activity. So, um, you know, the question of generally how PRP works for uh, androgenic alopecia, you know, there was a great uh, editorial in derm dermatologic surgery, the, you know, our premier journal in, in uh, dermatologic surgery generally. This was an editorial last year, which actually stated that the uh, preponderance of data today in peer-reviewed uh, articles that have been published in uh, peer-reviewed medical journals, that PRP does work well for androgenic alopecia. And there have been a lot of different studies. This was one that was published in the Journal of Cutaneous Aesthetic Surgery, um, where they actually uh, had looked at 50 male patients who had PRP injections to one half of the scalp and normal saline uh, as a placebo to the other half. They had six treatments at three week intervals and found a significant improvement in hair density quality and thickness on trichoscopy. This was another study, this was published more recently in 2018 in the Journal, Journal of Cosmetic Dermatology, where they looked at uh, PRP um, injections in female pattern hair loss. And what they found was in 30 uh, female subjects with female pattern hair loss, they injected PRP on one half of the scalp versus saline as the uh, placebo, did four weekly injections, and found a statistically significant improvement in hair density and thickness by a follow-scope at six months, and a very high overall patient satisfaction. So how do we actually use PRP for hair growth injection? Well, we usually inject eight cc's of cell fill. We do it once a month for four to six months, and uh, we inject the PRP really at one uh, centimeter uh, distances in the scalp, you know, in the areas of thinning. And then we do injections, one injection session every six months. Here are some of our patients before and after. You see a nice thick improvement in the frontal, frontal hairline. Here's a, a nice example of improvement in the crown area, in a woman's uh, crown area as well. And here are some other examples of uh, the securities of Dr. Singh of improvement with uh, PRP injections on the scalp. <clears throat> now this is a very interesting new system that I actually um, just was made aware of. This is the Kapili hair treatment tracking system. And I think this is something any practice that does a lot of PRP for hair growth, and I think a lot of you will be using cell fill for hair growth, uh, because of the data that I think is merely most most of the science really has been for cell fill in in you know generally in rejuvenation and for hair growth, but the Capilli system is actually really a great way not only to evaluate how your patients are growing their hair but also to market uh, PRP for hair growth. It's a, really a great way to show the results of your procedures. What it does is it actually takes global photos, as you can see here, and, and they will and you can do standardized photos, and also standardized close-up images of the hair. As you can see here, this is a global photo showing you know, 
you know, the same area, and then you can show the before and afters. And here is showing the changes, it actually measures the changes in hair density and hair thickness to also demonstrate efficacy uh, to your patients. So it's a very simple system to work with. You can actually speak with Jim Weeks. He can uh, tell you how you can uh, obtain this tracking system. We, we've been using it in our practice and we just started and I can tell you this is a great marketing tool and also a great way to measure the results of the um, treatment for hair loss. This is also another new um, helpful, really helpful uh, technology that we've added to our practice this past year. This is Prevodine. This is a topical numbing serum. This is a new a serum that's just been developed for rapid topical anesthesia. You can use it for a variety of different aesthetic and dermatologic procedures. It works in about 15 minutes, but the great thing about uh, this Prevodine um, solution is that it's not oily or greasy. You basically apply it to the uh, area that you want to have topical anesthesia. It's absorbed in five minutes. You don't have to wipe it off after. It's completely absorbed. You just wipe the area with alcohol wipe before doing treatment and the patient's ready for the procedure. So, you know, think about this for, you know, our patients who we're doing uh, cell fill for a hair growth and, you know, we're doing 20 or 30 injections in the scalp, which is, you know, is sometimes uncomfortable for some people. Even though we use 30 gauge needles, we now apply Prevodine to the scalp. It's not greasy, so patients don't end up with a greasy hair. If you're using BLT to the scalp, you know, people walk out with a greasy mop on their head. With Prevodine, it goes on very nicely. You don't have to wipe it off. The hair is not greasy after, and it works really well to numb the, numb the scalp before doing the uh, cell fill injections. You know, we use it for facial injections, for injectables, all types of fillers and toxins, for microneedling, lip injections, and uh, laser hair and tattoo removal treatment. So it works really, really well. The mechanism of action is actually very interesting. It creates this iontophoretic effect on the skin, which actually allows the stratum corneum to give access to larger model molecules. And this really improves the absorption of, of active compounds at the epidermal and dermal layer. And this is an example you know, of just regular topical lidocaine with an occlusive dressing. And if it's applied for 24 hours, it only permeates about 16%. When the lidocaine is combined with the thermality process, which is, Prevodent, uh, which is present in Prevodine, in one single application at the 24 hour mark, there's a 75% uh, permeation of the lidocaine. So look at the difference. Just top regular lidocaine absorbed by itself is only uh, permeated by about 16% versus 75% when you um, have it um, instilled in Prevodine. So this has really made a major difference in our practice. We actually did a study to see if it really does make a difference, say, compared to BLT. So this is a pilot study of 11 subjects. We treated our patients with either a CO2 laser, fractional CO2, or microneedling radio frequency device. Half of the face was randomly selected to have either the Prevodine or topical BLT anesthesia. And then we asked patients um, afterwards in this questionnaire which side of the face was more painful. And bottom, the bottom line was this. They found that 64% of the, of the subjects found the side with the BLT anesthesia was actually more painful than the side treated with Prevodine. So we know the Prevodine is obviously more effective as a topical anesthesia. One more thing I just wanna add, you know, when we are doing um, PRP injections for hair loss, it's also, when we found it's very helpful to have a home care regimen uh, that our patients use when they are uh, having these treatments. We found that it really has a synergistic effect uh, this is a system we use. It's called Viviscal. It really works well because um, it works while patients, they use this at, at home as a supplement. And it's interesting to see how it actually came about. They actually looked uh, at a study of Scandinavian Inuits in the 1980s. And this, this group of people actually were found to have very little hair loss as they age. And they try to figure out 
what was different about them, where they had such little hair loss in a population compared to most people. And they found that their diet was really rich in deep sea marine proteins. So they eventually did the studies and came out with this amino mark complex. And that's what uh, is in the Viviscal um, supplement and elixir. There are about 13 clinical trials um, looking at the efficacy of Viviscal for hair growth, as you can see in all these different studies here. And basically they found you know, that this works in men and women, and particularly in women, they found that in 57 to 80% uh, in, increase in terminal hairs at three and six months post um, having started the regimen with Viviscal respectively, a 12% increase in the hair diameter and a 39% reduction in hair shedding. So you know, people found they also can tell a significant improvement in the hair loss um, using the Viviscal supplement and their elixir. And here are some examples of um, the Viviscal treatments before and after. And you can see the nice you know, improvement in the thinning before and after. So this is, this is really a great uh, at-home treatment while our patients are having uh, their PRP and self-fill injections in the office. So to sum up, uh, what are the benefits of uh, platelet-rich plasma and particularly a platelet-rich fibrin matrix or cell fill? It's the patient's own blood products, particularly for people who you know, want that natural uh, treatment. Um, you can't get more natural than your own blood products, it's, which are obviously a rich source of growth factors. So there's no risk of allergic reactions. And in addition to significant TFTROF filling effects that we found, as I showed you in that study, we find that uh, PRFM really has a great rejuvenation benefit on the skin surface, as well as improvements in hair growth. So thank you very much for your attention. And um, I think uh, Jim is going to ask anyone who has any questions to just uh, go down to the bottom of the, uh, of the screen and... Uh, put in your, um, in the chat section, I think, Jim, chat section, you're going to ask. Yeah, me. yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a couple here, Dr. Katz. So I'll just kind of read some to you. We've got time for just a few because I don't want to keep people too long tonight. So the first question is, um, what is the difference in results by using PRP with fraction on the surface as opposed to direct dermal injection with fractional? Uh, you know, that's a good question. It's hard to say. Um, I think you probably get equivalent results though. Uh, some people like to use um, a direct injection, but you know, you're also getting the benefit if you're doing it in combination with the fractional laser because you're getting the PRP and the, um, and the laser treatment. If you're asking what's the difference between you know, fractional and topical PRP versus fractional laser and injection, um, I think you probably do get a better result by injecting it directly into the skin because you know we know it is definitely getting into the skin. Uh, the laser um, it depends on you know how deep you set the laser, the diameter of the actual uh, fractional zones of ablation. So that really adds a you know a var variability that may not allow for complete absorption of the PRP. Okay. Uh, the next question is: Does everyone have five alpha reductase? Well, we see it um, increase in uh, people who have androgenic alopecia, and that 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 effect on the uh, the uh, hair receptors uh, really it contributes to the hair loss. Okay. Um, next question: Were the neck injections sub Q? With the neck injection sub Q, yes, we injected. No, no, they were injected into the dermis. We did inject it into the dermis, well, but you know sometimes it goes into the sub Q also. But we actually try injecting it into the dermis. Okay, um, how did you track hair growth prior to using the Capilli system? Just photography and dermoscopy, trichoscopy. Well, you know, we use, we really base it on, uh, you know, digital photography. We didn't really use trichoscopy unless we're doing studies because that's, you know, more involved um, procedure. But the Capilli system is so simple. That's why we really got uh, involved with this. And uh, it's made a huge difference uh, in, in the ability not only to track 
the improvement in hair growth, but also as a great marketing tool. You can show examples of patients who've had the significant improvement with uh, the PRP injections to patients, and you can show them through the Compili illustrations and photographs um, and show them how well it works. Okay. Uh, next question, do you combine the PRFM with any mesotherapy or skin hair growth factor solutions? Uh, no, it works so well by itself, there's no reason to. Uh, what we do is we combine it with the Viviscal system and we also have patients um, using a topical minoxidil. If uh, they're uh, post-menopausal, we'll actually use topical minoxidil and finasteride, a combination. And uh, in some men, if they're interested, we'll use uh, finasteride orally. And that's basically um, our regimen. Okay. Can you comment on the safety and efficacy of PRFM in patients who already had hair transplant? That's a, actually a very good question because a lot of hair trans surgeon, a lot of hair transplant surgeons will use PRFM at the time of the hair transplants. So it's certainly um, safe. They, I think they feel that it actually improves the yield of the hair transplants. And there's certainly no problem injecting the PRFM in people who've had hair transplants in the past into those areas of the hair transplants as well. Okay. Um, next question. How large of a surface area can Prevodine be used on safely? Well, you know, we can certainly use it on the entire scalp. That's not a problem. I wouldn't use it under occlusion, like we don't use you know, topical lidocaine under occlusion, except in very small areas. Um, but that's an important point to make. It's, it is lidocaine, and you don't want to use it on large areas of the body. Uh, you want to keep it to small areas. You do not want to occlude it, particularly. There have been instances of people going into uh, seizures if they apply it to large areas and then put cell, you know, saran wrap on it. But it's completely safe to apply to an entire scalp or an entire face. Uh, and it works really well. And, and oh, I, I forgot to mention, Prevodine does not require a prescription. So it's really easy to get and it's a lot, it's a lot less expensive than most BLT or topical lidocaine preparations. And we use it, you know, in you know, bucketfuls in our practice for, you know, um, microneedling, for fractional CO2, for fillers, for, um, for uh, toxins. And don't forget, this saves your staff a lot of time also because they don't have to wipe it off after. So they just apply it. Um, you know, it's a complete, completely absorbed. There's no greasy or thick feeling on the skin after. It's great for applying it to the scalp. So, you know, patients don't have a greasy scalp after applying BLT. The Prevodine is easy to use. And instead of spending five or 10 minutes on every patient wiping, you know, the thick BLT off, Prevodine is absorbed. You can just go in and do the treatment. Okay. Um, next question. How deep are the hair restoration injections? We want to inject basically into the superficial um, uh, sub-Q. So it's basically just subdermal. That's where the hair follicles are. Okay. Just looking to see if there's any other ones here. I think that's about it for tonight, Dr. Katz. Um, there are a couple of other questions here, which we will cover. I don't want to keep people uh, you know, too late here. Uh, I want to thank everyone, first of all, for attending our webinar this evening. And I want to personally thank Dr. Katz for his time and for a great presentation. As I mentioned prior to the webinar, if anyone has any interest in any of the products that they've seen and heard about tonight, please visit southfield.com, fill out the contact uh, portion on the website, and we'll make sure we have the rep in your area contact you promptly. And um, with that, I, I'd like to say uh, thank you again to everybody, and everyone have a good evening. And Jim, you might want to just add, if anyone's interested in Prevodine or Capilli system, that they contact you. 
right? You want to get yeah, and they can also you, yeah. I I will be monitoring that Southwell.com contact session for all of these products, so that's why I oh. wanted to keep it simple and focused for everybody. Okay. So okay. no matter which of the products, even if it's Viviscal, Prevenine, or Capilli, you can fill out the information on the self fill contact form, and I will make sure that some that a rep contacts you right away.